artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 191. Today we will conclude the interview with Frank Sauer. We are talking about autonomous weapons, or as Frank more accurately puts it, autonomy in weapons, a notoriously hard issue to unpack. But Frank has the qualifications to help us. He is head of research at the Metis Institute for Strategy and Foresight and a senior research fellow at the Bundeswehr University in Munich. He has a PhD from Goethe University in Frankfurt and is an expert in the field of international politics with a focus on security. His research focuses on the military application of artificial intelligence and robotics. He is a member of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. He is also the co-host of the German language podcast called, and I'm going to give this my best attempt, Sicherheitshalber, on all matters security and defense. Let's get back into the interview with Frank Sauer. I'm wondering whether conventional battlefields will develop in ways like you're talking about using quadcopters as information gathering devices that assist a ground force that could destabilize the ability of humans to make useful proper judgments. But I guess that's perhaps too speculative. Like a skill degradation uh, mm. issue, kind of the same way we don't remember phone numbers or know our way without Google Maps or something like that? I'm coming back to, in my mind, I'm thinking about the drone warfare conducted from somewhere in Nevada where they remotely pilot something and they are trying to decide, is this thing on the other side of the world a hostile or not? And usually a bunch of people vote and then they engage and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And if that's something that we've been developing that kind of warfare over the last few decades, is that potentially going to go into a direction where we become more comfortable making decisions that might be wrong? Yeah, I would translate this into some sort of confirmation bias mm. put forward by the human with regard to using the machine. And I do see that as a problem. And if you look at, I'm again, I'm not naming specific companies, but let's just say in the US, there are specific startup companies, especially, who are trying to mix it all up by giving military personnel a sleek interface. Now, of course, comes with an LLM, so you can just you know easily talk to that system to manage the battlefield, battlefield management systems and the stated goal of within NATO in the end. But, you know, that is, of course, mostly spearheaded by the U.S. is a joint all domain command and control system where you kind of in a very abstract manner looking no fog of war, of course, the, <laughs> which is always the idea and never works. But you're looking at the battle space, and all you're doing as a human is basically saying, I am certain that within the confines of my rules of engagement and the international humanitarian law, I want some sort of force, lethal force, let's say, on that target. And the system of systems will be doing the rest. So we're not talking a specific weapon platform with a specific weapon is piloted by a human doing something. The humans will only be saying, we want force there and the system will manage the rest. Which platform is actually delivering that? The humans probably don't want themselves to be even concerned with that. Mm. This is the level of abstraction that we're aiming for with using these kinds of systems in modern militaries. Now, we're a far cry from that. I basically described to you like the PowerPoint presentation of where they want to be. But that's definitely what the research and development projects are aiming for. And I would say that is quite, there's some dystopic element to that because we are quite far from what is actually happening and from the actual explodey and dying hmm. elements of war fighting. This is a good introduction to talking about strategic defense and destabilization. The Future of Life Institute released a new video, Artificial Escalation, that depicts the use of a commercial 
AI-based system for national defense, in this case, Taiwan, and the risks of it making incorrect decisions or being deployed in a way such that people didn't have the time to make decisions that were useful to prevent escalation of war between mainland China and Taiwan because of dots on a screen crossing boundaries and the AI system telling them this is 99% likely to be a threat. Here's what you should do. And they're looking at this going, I'm just here to rubber stamp your decision because I have no idea what else to do. Mm. How real is that? Can you speak to that question? If, is that a an area of primary concern? I would say it's not real now, but it is a very important possible future to ponder. And it's maybe not too overly complicated what we should be doing to avoid this kind of scenario that is depicted there. Basically, both those adversaries were in a position where humans were teamed up with machines and the goal was to make faster, better decisions. And so it kind of like a vicious cycle. Everything went faster and faster and the humans came under more and more pressure. And in the end, they were just kind of, as you said, rubber stamping what the machine was suggesting. So there was some confirmation bias and probably... It's, I don't think that that's in the video, but that is always a problem with using these kinds of systems is, well, in training, we train it this way and it was always right. <laughs> you know, and so you're kind of as a human, you're used to the machine just being correct 23 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds of the day. What happens if in that one second you are supposed to be, you know, the failsafe in that human machine relationship? That's just, you know, it's very hard to train. But looking at the scenario depicted in especially that video, I'd say just call up the other side. You know, we've had this in during the Cold War with the red telephone, with the hot wire between Moscow and Washington. There's a real reason why these things came into being, because we have had these kinds of malfunctions of machines in the you know nuclear domain and people were put in a position where they thought, well, we're under attack by, let's say, 15 intercontinental ballistic missiles you know, launched from the Soviet Union. Are they actually attacking? Or is this maybe a malfunction of the computer? And, you know, so far, we now know it always was a malfunction. But for these kinds of things, just calling up the other side and ask them, is that really what you're doing just to get an additional data point on what it is that you're looking at, that might be one really smart thing that doesn't require a lot of technology and that could be put into place. The key really is risk management and de-escalatory mechanisms built into that system from the get-go. Otherwise, we might end up in that sort of self-reinforcing conflictive situation. Let's talk about then the strategic nuclear situation, because I think we pat ourselves on the back, I mean, collectively, without sufficient justification, because we're still alive and figure we must be good at this thing where it really comes down to having won a series of coin tosses. And I like to take every opportunity I can to tell people who aren't otherwise aware of it, that they probably owe their lives to people like Vasily Arkhipov and Stanislav Petrov, who in different situations went outside of their operational parameters in warfare and their training to do what turned out to be a decision that prevented all-out nuclear war. And now, of course, in the moment we start talking about this, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is everyone's thinking, oh, Skynet, you're talking about, because that is where people's brains go. Are we going to build something that will automate the decision-making here? And these systems are famously antiquated. But to what extent is the modernization of these an issue that you're tracking? I am tracking it. And it's an interesting development that in the last meeting between Biden and Xi, which was like very poor in terms of concrete agreements, one of the things that they at least assured each other is that they won't let automated decision making in AI into their nuclear weapons complex. That's interesting. So it just goes to show that you know this is stuff that people at the very top are concerned 
But just to maybe give the listeners an idea what the pull factors here are, I remember being at a conference in the U.S. where we were talking about very much those kinds of things. And I remember that we ended up discussing AI-assisted decision-making in the nuclear command and control system. And everybody in the room was like, well, obviously nobody would be you know, stupid enough to be doing that or even be calling for something like this. Well, lo and behold, it took like a year or so. And then the first articles popped up where it said we need a dead hand system. You know, the Russians have some sort of, it's called perimeter, um, and we're not sure if it's still in existence. And we're also not 100% sure how automated it would have been. But the idea isn't new. Everybody who has seen Dr. Strangelove knows about the idea. And the, the dead hand that the Russians built was in a way a fairly automated system that it would, if a decapitation strike had happened to Moscow, would still have enabled a retaliatory strike by some sort of automated processes that would have at least put an option on the table to launch what was left of the Soviet nuclear arsenal. And so that's why I'm saying the dead hand. And this article came up was saying, well, we need an AI dead hand, basically. And the arguments that were advanced were all bollocks, basically, because they were saying, well, everything is so fast and we've got, you know, the early warning times are so minuscule. And so we need to hand everything over to the machines because they're doing everything so much faster. And so everything needs to be done by AI. And I, in my first life, I did my PhD work was on nuclear weapons. I've spent a lot of time thinking about these kinds of things. And I thought to myself, what's new? A sea launch ballistic missile from a submarine, you know, on the close to the eastern shores of the US would have an early warning time, six to seven minutes. So we've been in that place for decades. You know, if the Russians launch a medium range ballistic missile from Kaliningrad to Berlin, five to six minutes and, you know, we're toast. So there's nothing new here. We've existed with this and no one, you know, was necessarily keen on automating everything because we knew what the risks are. But again, pull factors in that conference room, when still everybody was sure that nobody in his or her right mind would ever suggest this, was a lady from one of the U.S. nuclear labs. And her point was, and that was just really mind-boggling to me, that she said, we will not get any recruits. We won't be able to hire personnel if we're using five point, uh, what is it, five point quarter floppy disks, you know, those old floppy disks, not the 3.5 ones, but the five inch ones. Mm -hmm. They said, our computers are so old, we can't get college graduates because they look at this and they're like, are you kidding me? What is this equipment? This is too old. I do not want to work in this place. And so she said, we need to modernize and everything needs to be new and shiny in AI so we can hire people. And I was like, that is the weirdest argument <laughs> in this <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in this discussion to make. But it was made in all sincerity. And it just gave me pause because it shows how very strange things sometimes play a surprisingly big role, like idiosyncrasies of organizations and all kinds of other things might play into uh, developments that from the outside you would say are just rationally speaking, inexplainable, basically. But yeah. And I think perhaps it illustrates that we, as we get further and further away from global warfare that was conducted in the past, as we get more distant from World War II, the Vietnam War and so forth, that the memory of that recedes collectively and that people can rank things like the ability to hire new graduates that can maintain these systems as more important than other concerns. What's your biggest concern with respect to volatility in nuclear arms control at the moment? My biggest concern in that regard is not necessarily linked to anything AI. It is just what we're seeing at the moment, namely the immense buildup that the Chinese are undertaking, which even at conservative estimates, we'll put them at the end of this decade at around a thousand plus nuclear warheads, which already has triggered discussions in the US. Well, maybe we should be doing something to our arsenal. And obviously, we have at the same time Russia depleting their conventional forces in Ukraine and uh, most likely being reliant even more on their nuclear capabilities in the future. And all of these things, basically, this triangulation is happening. And at the same time, all these 
the mechanisms, processes, the understandings and the treaties and binding, you know, legal instruments that we had with regard to arms control are just, you know, fading away. Everything is eroding. You know, we lost the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in Europe. New start is history. Who knows what happens to the non-proliferation regime in five to 10 years. And so that is really what gives me grave concerns that we're kind of back at the beginning, almost in the late 50s, early 60s, with regard to the possibility of a real new arms race where we're just building warheads and building missiles and so on. And even though we kind of, you'd think that as a species, we kind of had this, you know, collective learning curve that said, well, maybe we should also have some guardrails for that <laughs> because we will just enter that arms race without end and, you know, spend oh, tons of money just to have so many weapons that we can make the radioactive rubble bounce a couple of times after we're already like gone. That gives me like really, really a uh, pause. And one of the key questions really, and I don't mean that like in an overly critical, but purely in an analytical way, is that the Chinese have a deep distrust to arms control. They're just not socialized into engaging with these kinds of political processes. So in that way, we are with the Chinese, we're in, kind of in a position uh, similar to how the US and the Soviets found them at the beginning of the 60s. And then came the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then they were all <laughs> very afraid, let's say, almost I would have said something, <laughs> some, uh, something, uh, you know, that probably would have been bleeped out. So they gave them a real injection of deep anxiety about what they were doing. And then arms control really got into gear and they kind of socialized each other into a more or less functioning system where we had some caps on that. And with China, there's just nothing like this. China's looking at these things from a completely different perspective. China just doesn't want to engage into any kind of meaningful arms control. Uh, maybe some risk reduction measures, but that's about it because they think, well, it's our turn now. Our, your arsenals are still huge. We've got like these 350 warheads we were doing a build-up for the next decade or so, and why would we be engaging in arms control with you? This is just another instrument of you, the West, to keep us tied down. And they're just done with that. They don't want to do that at all. Mm. And then again, I'm saying that I'm not saying this to you know be overly critical of China. I'm saying that this is analytically speaking what we're dealing with. So we will probably need to find a way to somehow maybe get them to the negotiation table nevertheless. But Everybody's right. looking for answers in that regard, and I certainly don't have one. And during the Cold War, there was a lot of research done on game theory about the US and Soviet Union standoff, but those all oriented around a two-player game, and introducing a third player into that is going to change all of that in ways that I don't know if we've considered adequately. Yeah. That is definitely a three-body problem, which makes it chaotic and hard to predict, yeah. If someone is listening to this and they're concerned, they're like, I want to do something about this, and they're in conversation with, or they want to write to their elected representative and tell them to do something, what should they ask for? I think the definite sane thing to ask for is to keep nuclear weapons, at least for now, away from AI. So that's one definite thing. So if you want to write to your senator or whatever, then, you know, be doing that. The other things like with regard to AI in conventional warfare and what we were talking about before, to be perfectly honest, the US is set up quite well in that regard already. They've had a doctrine. It's a document number 3000.09. You can look it up online. It's called Autonomy in Weapon Systems. And they've had this since 2012. And the US is now in the third revision of this document. And I know a lot of the people who wrote this, and these are smart people and people who understand the problems, but they still obviously working in the Pentagon want to, you know, leverage all the, the benefits that that technology can give their armed forces. And so you can probably enter into a debate with regard to, is this doctrine good enough? Or maybe you should be doing some more or maybe doing it a bit different here or there. But that is like a super nerdy expert discussion that I wouldn't want to put on your listeners. But nuclear weapons, I would definitely say as deeply flawed as we are as humans, at least we're capable of you know, being afraid 
I wrote a book called Atomic Anxiety, where I was basically dealing with this underanalyzed uh, notion of fear in that whole nuclear enterprise. We kind of kicked that out because we made everything rational and, as you said, game theory and Thomas Schelling and deterrence logic and so on and so forth. And we kind of forgot about the anxiety that is like the baseline of all of it. And I think that's a good thing, that we can still be afraid of nuclear weapons. That's the only thing that keeps us from using them against each other. And if we're delegating too much to machines, they won't be afraid. They will just be doing what they think is right. When um, ChatGPT burst into the mainstream just a bit over a year ago, was there anything about the way people reacted to that and used it that gave you some insight into perhaps people's willingness to use AI recklessly? For sure. I mean... ChatGPT, for instance, in my field, teaching at the university, for instance, I think has changed the game completely. The usual things that you would have students write, like taking home exams and papers and everything, I am in the process of like reworking everything. I'm kind of sitting with them together. We're using ChatGPT to produce text, and then we're also then we're talking about what is it that the LLM is producing. Can we use it? Can we not use it? What's good about it? What's bad? Train them in a critical way of employing this technology rather than basically sitting here reading plagiarized work, you know? <laughs> so we, I think it is definitely mixing up everything. And I'm absolutely 100% certain that in a couple of years, people will have deep and to them meaningful relationships with LLM powered systems that will be their companion or their assistant, or maybe they're even there, some sort of, you know, love interest in a way. Hmm. And so I think it, it will change things. And the problem really with the recklessness that you were saying is that in the end, I am, so I'm of two minds. First of all, when ChatGPT came out, I was like the rest of us, I think, pretty blown away. And that's one of the reasons why I was saying before, I am in the never say never camp. So ChatGPT kind of was astounding to me with regard to how far we've come in how little a time. Or look at DALI and MidJourney and those image generators. One year, it's insane what has happened in that space. So I think we will be making more progress, but I still am of the opinion that in the end, those systems like ChatGPT are stochastic parrots. And the recklessness, I think, is not really understanding that and just mystifying AI to, like I said before, with that silver bullet, like it's a magic sauce that you put on things, for instance, war fighting, and then everything gets better. Everything gets faster, more IHL compliant, less collateral damage, and so on and so forth. Everything that you could possibly be wishing for. And that's, I think, the recklessness. Understanding what AI is, what it can and cannot do, and then using it in a responsible manner. That's, to me, the real challenge. Mm. I think this is a good point to start wrapping up then. I'm having dystopian visions dancing in my head of chat GPT being used to write the next versions of legislation or strategic arms limitations treaties or evaluate diplomatic responses to things like that. But we know where that story goes. Where would you like to tell our listeners to go to find out more about this from people such as yourself or other organizations and people that you respect? I think a good space to look at is the Stop Killer Robots campaign website. I mean, this is clearly looking at the whole issue from a humanitarian disarmament point of view. But this is just a global movement of NGOs, very smart people. They also do research. So you will also find from there, from their website, a big repository of where we are in terms of technology, like what's happening, what is being developed in the world. And that is, I think, a good first place to dip your toe in and then go from there. Thank you very much, Frank Sauer, for coming on AI and You. Thank you. That was fun. That's the end of the interview. The two names I mentioned early on, Vasily Arkhipov and Stanislav Petrov, are completely worth your attention and copious research. Frankly, they deserve to have their pictures on your wall because you and I would, as I said, probably be dead or never been born if it weren't for their actions. Arkhipov was a naval officer on a Soviet submarine in the combat zone during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The submarine was being bombed with depth charges by the US Navy to force it to the surface, but the US did not know that the submarine carried a 5-kiloton nuclear 
tipped torpedo that could destroy their ships. The submarine captain and political officer agreed to fire the torpedo, but nuclear protocol required Arkhipov to concur, and he did not. It was a big argument, but he held fast, and the submarine surfaced among the American ships. Had the torpedo been fired, it would certainly have precipitated an all-out nuclear war between America and the USSR. Petrov was on duty in the Soviet Union's equivalent of NORAD in 1983, just days after the Soviets had shot down KAL Flight 007 and tensions were again sky-high. The Soviet warning system announced that nuclear missiles had been fired from the U.S. towards them. Protocol required reporting this to Petrov's superiors, who would certainly have launched an immediate counterstrike. But Petrov felt that the warning was a bug and waited. He was subsequently proven right. Later on, they discovered that the system had been fooled by sunlight reflecting off high-altitude clouds. The other two officers, who took alternating shifts for Petrov's job, were judged to have been very likely to have reported such information to their superiors immediately had they been in that position. Again, you and I are here because of one man. Arkhipov and Petrov, neither of whom received recognition or reward at the time, were the first two recipients of the Future of Life Institute's Future of Life Award. In today's news ripped from the headlines about AI, Spotify has an AI-powered voice translator that can turn a podcast into another language. Their examples showcased Lex Fridman, Dax Shepard, Monica Padman, and other podcast hosts transitioning from speaking English to another language mid-sentence, and it sounds just like them, only in Spanish. French and German are on the way. It uses OpenAI's voice generation technology, the power behind ChatGPT's voice, to accomplish this. And it truly sounds impressive. I can't wait to bring it to this show. Next week, we will have a special episode where I'll revisit my 2017 book, Crisis of Control, and review what I said about our timeline for solving the value alignment problem with AI. For much of the time since its publication, those arguments were a bit out on the fringe. But the last year has seen concern about existential effects of AI become fodder for respectable conversation. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Artificial Intelligence and You and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U.net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.